it's a delight, of course, on the Missions Focus Weekend. I get to sit in the first hour and, and hear the word preach and just fills my heart up. So grateful for that. And as you know, um, it's always um, a choice to make when you think about what you're going to be saying on the Lord's Day during a Missions Focus Weekend. And I don't suppose, I, I was talking with Matt the other day and I said, what are you going to preach on? He said, Mark 4 and... I thought, well, I'm just going to continue then in Luke 17 because I couldn't have asked for a greater intro, really, uh, to what we've been discussing in our study in Luke 17. You'll see why in just a moment, but take your Bibles and look with me at the Gospel of Luke. We opened up this new chapter last Sunday, and some of the ways that the Word was opened up to us in the first hour become for us really a runway for the finishing up of these first 10 verses in Luke 17. Remember for a moment, if you have been with us, that the, the backdrop of what Jesus says here, the living illustration, if you, were, if you will, about what he says here, is really the, the nation of Israel and its leadership. Where is Israel and where is the leadership on whether they have a relationship with God or not? And it has been very apparent to everyone around that the Pharisees, the leaders of Israel, the heads of the nation have an open contempt for the ministry and the person of Jesus. The apostles and the many other followers of Jesus and all the towns and villages that pepper the countryside, they're already aware of this. They already know that the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and the message of Jesus had become the ultimate humiliation to the religious leaders of Israel. And his blameless life was a massive issue. You know how it is. You get around a non-Christian and suddenly they, they say you're judging them. <laughs> we haven't even had a conversation. I remember that. I, I worked with a crew at, at some point in, in the military. You're always at close range in those, uh, on those crews when you're doing work for the armed forces, and, and I remember some of the non-Christians in that group, one in particular, this gal just said to me, you're judging my life. We haven't even had a conversation about what we believe or how we live. We're just on a crew together. I said, how is it that I'm judging your life? Well, you, you know, you don't involve yourself in our conversations and this and that. And I said, well, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm not against you personally. You live the way you want to live. I I'm, I'm hope you're comfortable with the way you want to live, but I I have a set of beliefs and principles I want to live by that keep me from some of those things. This is, of course, the same exposure that was happening to the religious leaders of the day, and, and they were being systematically exposed to their humiliation. Christ's blameless life exposed their sin and their guilt. And through the, the inf now infamous dialogues that they were having, their evil was continually unmasked. It was gross hypocrisy. If that weren't enough, Jesus' displays of supernatural power at this point, at such stunning levels, were so compelling to the masses that it made them listen to his message. And they hated that, the Pharisees did. Because when Jesus was preaching the message, it was an exposition of the Old Testament scriptures, their Old Testament. The word of God they said they loved and that they were teaching the people. And Jesus kept showing that the scriptures undeniably pointed to him and his life and his ministry as Messiah, their Messiah. Their spiritual shepherding was a sham. They rejected the truth of the scriptures but pretended obedience to it while they themselves got rich and exploited the poor. They twisted the Old Testament so that they could appear to be holy while behind the scenes and sometimes out in the open they lived immoral lives, greedy lives, slanderous lives. Idolatry was rampant. The contrast, beloved, between they and the Lord Jesus could not be sharper. Jesus personified the truth because he is truth. And Israel is supposed to be the channel for others to know the truth and to turn to God in repentance and humility and faith. But they became the obstacle, the primary obstacle to the truth. 
As Paul would later say to the church at Thessalonica that was born out of that idolatrous city and the Jews had tried to follow Paul in there and say, ah, Paul doesn't care about you, he hates you, he's just in love with himself. Paul said, listen, they're doing the same thing that Israel has done for centuries. They kill the prophets and he said they hinder us from speaking the gospel to the Gentiles that they might be saved. First Thessalonians 2.16 and so what does Jesus do here? The Pharisees had been, had been challenging him and he had exposed their love of money and their greed and their exploitation of people for the sake of uh, their religious fal false teachings and their pretense. And so he now, as the Pharisees have taken off and they've gotten out of the crowd, there are disciples around Jesus along with the 12 that he's chosen and he is speaking to them with those Pharisees as the backdrop, and he gives here what is quite understandable at this point, a warning. A warning. I told you last time, this is a warning about being a person through whom the spiritually vulnerable are led away from the truth and not toward it. It is the warning to those who would give themselves to a pretense, a spiritual pretense, and lead the vulnerable away from the gospel and away from the truth. And it is a warning to all the disciples of Jesus to guard against the sin of the Pharisees. To pretend to be a follower of Christ and use your influence then to do the very opposite, to lead the unsuspecting and the vulnerable into more and more sin away from the truth. And Jesus' words here are intended to ripple outward to the masses with implications. First of all, run as fast as you can away from the phony shepherds of some phony gospel. Doesn't matter whether it's a prosperity gospel or whether it's some other false religion of works. It doesn't matter at the time if it was the shepherds of Israel, the people of God, allegedly. Run as fast as you can away from those that lead you away from the truth and not into it and not toward it. And don't follow and live in their hypocrisy. Because to live in hypocrisy, in gross hypocrisy, while you pretend some spiritual life is to become self-deceived, you'll eventually believe lies about your relationship with God and you'll be blind to your true condition. And those are implications for those sitting there listening to Jesus give this warning. You say, is there a warning to true disciples of Christ? Yes, it ripples out even to true disciples of Christ. Don't let anything get in the way of knowing and living out the truth in your life. Fight for it. Strive in it. Know it. Learn it. Strive to live for it. Strengthen your faith in it. Always be about it. And by implication then, don't let the pride that blinded the Pharisees obstruct your spiritual vision so that your life begins to hinder someone else's access to the truth. Watch that carefully, beloved. Your life is not to become a hindrance to someone else's access to clarity. And so Jesus here in this warning he lays out some ways to stay away from the danger. I've called them reinforcements. You can call them anything you want. But here there are five reinforcements that protect us from the sin of becoming an obstacle to the truth. I gave you three of them last time. We'll cover the last two today. Obstacle number one was found in the very first statement that Jesus says in verse 1. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. Reinforcement number one, don't be naive about the world. Don't be naive about the world, or we could say about evil or, or sin or whatever. And I told you that in the original, it's stated a much stronger way. It is impossible that no stumbling blocks should come. In other words, you can't live in this fantasy life of a utopian Christian existence where everything's high-octane emotions and there is no sorrow and there is no burden, there is no fight, there is no striving, there is no struggle. You're just going to ponder Christ and it's going to be like we've been at a Getty concert the whole time, all our Christian life. That is not what we're to imagine this side of glory. What we're to imagine is stumbling blocks, battles, struggles for which we must wear the armor. I'm all for the high-octane moments, but I am also for any moment that strengthens faith 
And there are a thousand different moments that strengthen faith, as Jesus will point out. It's impossible this side of Christ's return to have a life where there are no scandala, scandalon, the enticements that cause the ruin of a soul. That's the word. Stumbling blocks. Scandals, a, a life of scandal, a life that hinders in a way that will lead someone to the ruin of their soul. His point is, Satan never stops scheming, the world never ceases to hate truth and suppress the truth and invent new forms of religion that defy the truth. So you've got Satan, you've got the world and his evil system, and by the way, our flesh always aggressively entices us with everything but the truth. It is impossible, so don't be naive about the world. That's the first thing Jesus indicates here. The second one, just by way of quick review, was don't be flippant about what God does say. Don't be flippant about his word as it relates to how it affects your life and other people's lives. Because, notice what Jesus says, it would be better, or woe to him through whom they come, these stumbling blocks, verse 1, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. It is, um, it is a strong expression of grief along with a call for consequences and it would be much more to your advantage to have some violent thing happen to you so that it would end your influence if you were to become a life of a Pharisee, a life of a phony, or someone who leads people away from the truth carelessly, recklessly, without concern. A flippant Christian life. Jesus said that, false teachers, if you ever want to read the consequences that are coming to those that are false teachers, read, read Jude and, and read the precursor to Jude, Second Peter, and you will see what God says about the frightening consequences of those that become that. And Jesus, of course, when he was on the earth, said the same thing to the Pharisees, woe to you. Woe to you because you, you lead people as if you're their spiritual shepherd. And when you grab them by the hand and convince them of your way, you lead them into becoming twice the son of hell that you are. It's frightening to see in scripture what that will result in. But you know, believers can do that too sometimes. Believers are chastened severely for pretending to lead and teach others, but to lead them away from the clarity of the truth. You say, how so? Well, we're, we're at times obstacles, beloved, and we have to think about that. Uh, a Christian parent who, who says one thing and puts demands on their children in one way, but does not live it, uh, not necessarily not living it consistently, but does not repent of not living it. In other words, a parent who is in gross, blatant hypocrisy without ever calling it what it is, without ever owning it as a sin and repenting of it, and, and striving to keep that from these little lives. And how about sometimes the way we nurture worldliness? We can be obstacles to the truth when we, we nurture some worldly thought or lifestyle or habit. You say, how do we do that? Well, anytime you, anytime you argue with Scripture... You're nurturing worldliness. It is a worldly heart. It is the flesh that argues with Scripture. Philippians 2.14, never do anything by grumbling and disputing. It is a passage about throwing up arguments about the Christian life, about the work that God is doing. You can read it. Philippians 2.12 and 13, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, willing and working for his good pleasure. Don't do anything grumbling and disputing. Do everything without that, he says. What does that mean? It means stop throwing arguments up against God and against his word just because you secretly chafe at it in your heart. You are becoming an obstacle to the truth by nurturing a worldly heart. And then there are those who are vague about principles in the scripture. Why? Because they want to avoid accountability. We get vague about the scriptures. That is a way we become an obstacle to the truth. And then when we minimize sin. We become an obstacle to the truth. This very principle, being flippant about what God says, staying ignorant of the scripture because you don't like the specifics. It's exposing too much in your life. 
or minimizing sin by having a negative outlook uh, of righteousness. You know how people can be in the Christian life. They, they, see, they get around somebody who's actually striving in holiness and they have a problem with it. They're believers, but they have, have immaturity in their life. They have sin in their life. They don't want to expose what's in their heart. They get around believers that are more diligent and more faithful. And what's the first thing you do? Oh, you start to criticize people that are more faithful. Why? Because you feel exposed. Listen, you're flippant about what God says at that point and in danger of becoming a hindrance to the truth. Reinforcement number one, then, is don't be naive about the world. Number two, don't be flippant about what God says. Reinforcement number three we saw last time is don't, don't be negligent with each other's weaknesses. And notice verse 3, be on guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. This is just a section, not, not primarily about forgiveness as much as it is don't be negligent when it comes to the weaknesses in one another's lives. Or you could be hindering the truth and someone moving toward godliness. Look, how many times have we hindered someone's sanctification because God put them in our life to tell them the truth and we won't tell them? How many times have, some, have someone sinned against us and we won't forgive them, and yet Christ is the forgiver. He's the amazing forgiver, and we're never more like Christ than when we forgive, and yet we won't forgive. That is a hindrance to the truth, beloved. We are to forgive. And lavishly, he says, no matter how often it happens, you're always to be about body, life, and and uh, the steps one and two of Matthew 18 and going to one another and loving one another and confronting one another and being gentle as Galatians 6 1 says and doing it in a spirit of humility lest you be tempted and always being willing to heal and not wanting to destroy this is body life we keep one another from being a hindrance to the truth when we engage it's messy business isn't it it's fragile business because we are sinners, one and all. And man, we get thrown together to do a work for the gospel. How else was Christ going to keep us engaged and not hidden, circling the wagons and self-protective if he doesn't give us a command like this and say, if you don't do this, you're hindering the truth. How many churches don't have body life that's really strong because no one is doing this? Why? Eh, too afraid, self-preserving, compromising, don't want to be exposed, too messy, selfish, arrogant, lazy. That's a church that hinders the truth, and they don't even know it sometimes. So Jesus says, engage. If you're going to do this work, I want you to engage. Pharisees, they don't engage at that level. You know why? Because they're holding grudges against one another because they hate the truth of forgiveness. They don't know the Messiah. They don't know God's forgiveness. They don't love much because they don't believe they need to be forgiven much. John 7. And you know how they hinder the truth? They don't help anyone else with their sin. They actually like compromise. They like an environment where people will compromise because they like to compromise secretly. You know what they do? They get all negative about anyone else who might say they stand for the truth. Really? You stand for the truth? Everyone who secretly wants to coddle a life of sin is going to minimize the truth until they deal with that sin. At that point, Jesus says, you're being negligent. Don't be negligent with each other's sins. Don't go crashing in there in a finger-pointing session with your pride, but love people and learn to forgive people and learn to confess your sin to one another. And Jesus says, learn to go and, and reprove someone if you need to. Reinforcement number four. Reinforcement number four, don't be weak in your faith. Don't be weak in your faith. <laughs> Notice verse five, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. By the way, Luke includes apostles here because he's distinguishing them now as the 12 who've been commissioned. Later, of course, Judas will rebel and go his own way as was 
from the foundation of the world ordained, and later as they move to add to the 12, uh, add to the 11, that 12th apostle, you see in the book of Acts, Matthias was chosen. Later on, the apostle Paul comes, and he is in so many ways a 13th apostle, even by title, and yet he himself says, oh, I'm not included in the 12 ultimately. He's just an apostle raised up by the Lord to the Gentiles. Luke indicates apostles here because the instruction Jesus is about to give is particularly poignant to those that lead, to those that have that level of influence. And I can immediately understand the burden that so far now has flooded the hearts of these standing around Jesus especially the chosen apostles, because the implications of his warning must have sunk in, as they would. And so they said, increase our faith. The word, the verb means to nurture it, grow it, strengthen it. Give us more of, of something that will hold us. I get it. I understand this. Lord, let our faith be of the powerful kind that does what you've called us to do. We don't want to go down in history as the infamous 12 who led Jerusalem and the remotest part of the earth and everything in between into sin and unbelief. Yeah, you don't want to be. You don't want to be a Caiaphas who's on the pages of Scripture as infamous, rejecting the Messiah. You don't want to be that. Hopefully, if you've been living in hypocrisy, Religious pretense, you, you're a Nicodemus who, who eventually got it and gave his life to the Lord. I can understand what the apostles are thinking here. This is one of their better moments. I, I realize that he's going to clarify what they need to understand about faith, but th this is a better moment. Yet, yeah, Lord, forgive that many times. Don't, don't cause somebody to go into sin or unbelief. It's worse for you if, um, if you do that than if you had a violent death. Whoa! Lord, keep us from that. Increase our faith. I've prayed that many times. Lord, strengthen my faith. And it's a frightening thing to pray. Lord, do whatever it takes to strengthen my faith. But oh, it is what, it is what a disciple prays in their better moment. They didn't fully understand all that they needed to about how faith grows, but it is the right response to the terrifying words that Jesus had just given. And it's the right concern. It implies some things, and, and I just might want to give this to you to kind of spread it out. As I began to think about it, currently they're saying our faith is inadequate. That's a good place to be. Lord, I'm never arriving. I haven't arrived. My faith is always in need of stretching and strengthening my faith is inadequate. Listen, if you can maintain that heart right there, God will make you useful in ways you could not have imagined. The moment you imagine, I can take some time off or I can go on to cruise control. Sometimes you get in these seasons in your Christian life and you clearly are on cruise control. Everything seems to be going well. Job's doing well. Family seems to be on cruise control. There aren't any massive trials that other people seem to be facing. You're in a sweet spot, if you will, circumstantially. And in that springtime of life, you, you imagine eh, there'll be no summer or fall or winter coming. And if it does, it, it'll be of short duration, maybe a weekend trial, maybe a small headache spiritually. No, I, I like what you see here. Currently, it is the right concern. Our faith is inadequate. And then I also thought they, they must be imagining then that, that they need something more, not just that their faith is inadequate, but they need either more faith or the strengthening of it. Like I said, they use the verb to develop it. Lord, develop it, grow it, stretch it. But more importantly, they're looking at the task. Wow, Lord, apostles, your inner circle, you've chosen us to do something. Look, you can transfer that right to you. You're not one of the original apostles, but you are a testifier, a witness, if you will, maybe not the eyewitnesses of the New Testament, but a testifier. From their eyewitness came the gospel to you, and God saved you. And as Matt said so poignantly this morning, he didn't save you to be fruitless. They are getting it. If you gave us that task, 
and we're going to be the leaders, and Israel's leaders have already defected. Wow, I need something more. That is the right concern. They had extraordinary privilege. So do we, beloved. We know Christ, and the gospel came to us on the wings of a free country that is plunging itself into moral bondage and therefore gospel hindrance. We have been privileged. I often think, how much will we have to answer for? Whoa. How much will we have to answer for? I think of places like the darkness of Rome and the darkness of Italy where we send these blessed souls, these missionaries. And I think uh, those people, those missionaries must look back at us and think, what is wrong with you people? Privilege upon privilege, free digital resources, sermons at your fingertips, churches and people and places and believers. We've sent missionaries all over the world. And as the culture goes into darkness at breakneck speed, we're arguing with each other. We're playing games. Our churches are sometimes a circus of gimmicks. No, we're going to have to answer for a lot. The apostles got it. Given the task. We need something to strengthen us. But Jesus goes at this in a way that's so encouraging. Because they, though they have the right concern, he gives them the real case. Here's the real case of the matter. Verse 6, the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. I have to say a few things about this. First of all, the sort of the wild, uh, you know, name it, claim it, charismatic movements have landed on this verse as if there were some power in some verbal human proclamation or some power in faith itself and that, that somehow obligates God. Well, I can tell you that to get very careful with rightly dividing the text, the way that it is written here makes that absolutely impossible. First of all, if you had faith is hypothetical. The conditional way it's written here is merely presenting a hypothetical. He's not saying they don't have any faith or that they need some wild sort of kind of faith that, that can actually do the miraculous. That's, that's not his point. He's merely saying, hey, you have faith. But if you had faith that was really tiny, and notice what he says. You would say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted. You wouldn't know this from the English, but those verbs are passive. The subject is passive. That means that the power uh, to do something that defies what we would have imagined has to come from God. There's no power inherent in any verbal proclamation of a human being. There's no power in faith itself. You know what faith is? The scriptures tell us faith is being convinced that the promises of God made by the God who made them are enough. And you yield to those promises. That's why it's phrased this way. Be uprooted. It's a passive verb, be planted in the sea. There's another power at work through a Christian that believes the promises of the one who guaranteed that power. You heard it again this morning in Matt's sermon, if you were here first hour. Faith is just simply trusting in the power of God to bear fruit, and he bears fruit. There's no gimmick here. And of course he's using hyperbole or, or a metaphor here, just like he did in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, when he says to them, you know, the reason that you couldn't cast out a demon is because you, even though you have faith like a mustard seed, it's not genuine faith. You're still fearing man. You're still distrusting the promises of God. I'll do things that might defy your understanding, your logic, or what you thought might have happened. I'll do exceedingly abundantly above what you could ever imagine. But I'll only do it if you trust my promise. Ask anything in my name. Trust my promise. And I'll do it. Listen, you want the seeds of the gospel to go forth? You want the church to be strengthened? You want God's work to go forward and, and you be a channel and not a hindrance? You must know that if God promises something and you believe in that promise, even though the seed of that faith is small, its purity and its genuine pr trusting in the promises of God is why God acts the way he does through your life. That's his point here. 
Sometimes our faith is impoverished because though we say we believe it, we fear the powers of hell. And I'll tell you, the church has become so weak in our culture because we are fearing the evil government that is coming against religious freedom. Listen, our freedoms have never been true freedoms. Never. God has given us unbelievable, unprecedented access. And and the fact that we can be meeting here until the laws say we can't, that is a grace from the Lord for sure. But freedom? Listen, if you want to define freedom properly, it isn't democratic governmental freedom. Those are freedoms that are in the common grace of God, and they're not rights. Can I just tell you that right now? They're not supreme, they're not superior, and they're not rights. They may be civil rights under your government, but God ordains all government. Most people across the globe don't have any such thing. And they're still Christians, and they're still faithful, brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not rights. You know what freedom ought to be defined by? Freedom from sin in the gospel. And that's the only freedom worth having. And that's the, why the church gets weak. Because we're still fearing the powers of darkness. And when we say, God, save people, do a radical thing. You know what we're doing? we do? We fear the consequences. And so we're like, do it, but don't do it in a way that hurts me. Don't do it in a way that takes my freedoms away. And God keeps saying, look, if you would have pure, genuine faith then the thing that you thought not possible would happen. And by the way, the mulberry tree, it's no big deal to uproot a mulberry tree, humanly speaking. And I mean, moving a mountain and putting it in the sea, that was metaphor upon metaphor. But to move a mulberry tree in its roots, that's nothing. So why, why does Jesus use that here? That doesn't seem too impossible. His point is, look, that thing is going to grow when you put it in, in a place where God wants it to flourish. And just like a mulberry tree, when you put it in a place where it will flourish in its soil and in its nutrients, so your work will flourish if you even start with a small kind of faith that may be imperceptible to others, but it's genuine trust in the promises of God. God is using that then to grow his work. We fail to pray in genuine faith. James chapter 1 tells us that. You must pray in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Don't let that man expect he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Look, don't be two, two allegiances in your heart. They said, increase our faith. And Jesus said, look... I'm here to tell you that the real case is pure faith, even when, even when small, has huge impact. So that even the seemingly impossible, the thing you pray for that you never thought could happen, is possible. <laughs> Have you ever, you ever been praying for something? Maybe you haven't, but and been shocked like this. But I when I'm praying some, for something, particularly the salvation of someone that I love and know, I am shocked at how quickly the thought enters afterward, yeah, but God hasn't done anything in that area so far, and he probably never will. I mean, it's, it's just grief in my heart that it can go there so quick. It's sort of this spiritual cynicism and what's it based on? My assessment of what God's doing. As Matt said, you know, we see a fraction of it. Thank you, Matt, for the intro to this point. We see a fraction of what God is doing. And, and our assessment is he hasn't moved. Really, he hasn't moved at all. Hasn't done anything through your prayers. Hasn't moved in your life. Hasn't moved to sanctify you as you prayed. And, and you say, yeah, but my goal hasn't been reached. What in the world are you talking about, your goal? We don't pray to meet our goals. We pray for God to do what he wants to do. And we pray in faith because amazingly, when you pray something specific, sometimes he answers it in such a specific way. And you grow in your faith in a way that you hadn't before. You see his tenderness. Sometimes you get frightened at, at how close he is listening. Has that ever happened to you? Wow, he answered that prayer like that. It means he's actually listening. And I, I want him to listen, but I don't want him to watch my heart and my life when I'm praying because 
I got up from that prayer and went and did things I shouldn't do. Wow, Lord, who is this great God we serve? Jesus says to them, the seemingly impossible is possible. So don't be weak in your faith by fear of man, by fear of persecution, by fear of temporal troubles, or praying with two allegiances, or failure to nurture your own self-spiritual discipline, the things that you need to do, as God says, or failure to be sober-minded about the truth. Don't do that. And when you have faith like that, God is going to use you in amazing ways. And I I just marvel at how the Lord knows where we will go. And so just like the Christian life has this knife edge sometimes, right? I mentioned to you earlier, nurturing worldliness. You want to spend time with unbelievers, but it's a fine line sometimes because you don't know where balance is. I want to spend time with uh, sharing the gospel with those that don't know Christ. And at the same time, I could get my clothes burned, as James says, right? Snatching someone from the brand, uh, from the fire, but, but I have to be very careful that the garment that I'm wearing isn't polluted by the flesh. There's a fine line there. It's the same in every principle in the Christian life. There's a, there's a bit of a knife edge we walk because we could slip over on either side. If you think so much about the grace of Christ and not about what God commands, you end up antinomian. You end up against the regulations of Scripture in some hyper-grace confusion like you see today. On the other hand, if you never emphasize the cross or the grace and you always emphasize only the commands of Scripture, you could end up in some sort of moralistic sense that God is more pleased with your performance and loves you more because you obeyed this week. Look, it's a knife edge and Jesus knows that if he starts to use your genuine faith... There is a perspective you must have going into that. There's a perspective the apostles must have going into that. A perspective about ministry that you must have. That leads us to this fifth reinforcement, beloved. If the fourth reinforcement is don't be weak in your faith and God will mightily use you, this fifth reinforcement then is don't be proud in your service or usefulness to Christ. Don't be proud in your service or usefulness to Christ. How does Jesus answer this? With an illustration and then the principle's application. Notice what he just finished saying in verse 6. If you had faith like a mustard seed, you'd say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted in the sea, it would obey you. And which of you then, here's his illustration, Having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. No, but will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you may eat and drink? He doesn't thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, then say we're unworthy slaves. We've only done that which we ought to have done. Now, in this illustration, in this principle, he, he basically drives home the point, don't be proud in serving Christ. But he does it in a unique way. Because essentially they're saying, give us more to do more. And he has just said, no, your faith is weak if you think that's how it works. You know how this works? You give me your whole heart, believing my promises, as far as you understand them, so that even if it's a small seed of faith, it's genuine and it's pure trust. You give me that, and I will do everything in my work to stretch this faith muscle. I'll bring circumstances where my promises apply, and you're going to have to believe those promises. And you're going to have to believe promises over here and apply them to this area of your life. And in so doing, I'm going to strengthen your faith. But if it's real faith and therefore real usefulness, you must be careful to remember your status. Why is God doing that with us? Why does he want us to be useful? Why does he call us to usefulness and then give us the faith to do it? Because he gets the glory as one who has bought us with a price. We are not our own. Notice the The illustration includes this sense of being owned by Christ. That's why he uses a slave analogy. Again, anytime the Bible uses the word slave, you have to know that in the original, for the most part, 
if it's translated slave about an inanimate object or an illustration about someone else rather than yourself, the Bible translators have translated it slave because it is the word slave. And, and by the way, the fact that slaves existed and have existed since human, humans have lived uh, does not change the fact that human beings abuse everything that exists, including the whole indentured servitude and ownership by someone else on your estate, all of those things. But if you imagine when you read the scriptures that you're not going to see slavery and that some of it was actually a protection for those cultures that were impoverished, then you've mistaken the whole history of the whole issue of indentured servitude and ownership. It doesn't make it right when someone treated it with evil. It would be wonderful if everyone had enough money to sort of live on their own, but there was indentured servitude. There was what's called uh, ownership, that is to say slavery as it's translated in the New Testament, because there were some people who were so impoverished their families would go out of existence if they didn't become beholden to the property and estate of someone else. And by the way, they weren't all treated in evil ways. That's why Jesus never went after that issue. He only went after the heart and character of someone who had someone on their estate who was indentured. At the same time, any time in human history when it has been treated as some sort of way to dominate and oppress people as if they're not actual persons has been utterly wicked and is always condemned in Scripture, always. We're to love one another. Everybody is created equal in the eyes of the creator. We're never to curse other human beings or look down at other human beings as if we're better. Not only are we all sinners and peers in sin, but we're all made in the image of God. And James makes it very clear. If you praise God with one side of your mouth and you curse men with the other side of your mouth, these things ought not to be. So clearly, evil such as that of any form in any societal structure is terrible and condemned by scripture. Nonetheless, the illustration is used here to make the point. You have someone who is indentured. They are owned by the, the estate itself and the owner of the, the estate. And slavery in that sense was a status that meant you belonged to the estate. And when you were treated well, you worked the estate and you gained food from the estate, but you served the estate. It was your livelihood. It was your life. It's how your children and grandchildren survived. That's how it was. And when you signed yourself over to that kind of service or were bought out of a slave market and out of poverty and nothingness into that kind of service, you knew you get the privileges of whatever that owner and that service provided. And, and in a good situation, it was survival and it was wonderful and it was generationally beneficial when it wasn't evil. It doesn't condone it. I'm not saying all societies ought to have it. It's just how it was. It's just how it was. But Jesus uses it here to point that very thing, that the slave's status is, notice, he's plowing or tending sheep. That's what he did. He, he did his work for the survival of the estate. You had livestock. He took care of them. You had crops to take care of. He took care of those. And Jesus says, which of you who has that scenario will say to him when he's come in from the field, I've prepared dinner. I'm going to take care of you um, because we're equals. No, that isn't the point. The landowner's assumption is different. The landowner's assumption, notice verse 8, is no, you will, you're not finished with your day until the the work of the estate is finished, which includes not only taking care of the crops and the livestock, but all that that would do to sustain the household, including coming in and making sure that food got to the table and making sure that the people of the household were cared for. That was your job. That was your job. There's a landowner's assumption here. It's, it belongs to him. And notice, he says, you're not going to say, Verse 7, come immediately and sit down to the workers of the estate, the servants of the estate. No. Will he not say to him, you prepare for me something to eat, properly clothe yourself, serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? After the role that you have is completed, then you may be sustained by the completion of the work? Notice verse 9. He doesn't thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? What does that mean? It's a self-evident truth that in the hierarchy of ownership 
and servitude, no one would have expected the one whose resources everything belongs to say anything to those who are benefiting from it already just by being a part of it. That's the whole point. It wouldn't be some ceremonial, thank you, thank you, thank you. Nor would the servants expect it. Never. That that would make no sense. The whole system would turn upside down if that were the case. He's already benefiting from it. Hey, I belong to this estate. Therefore, I belong to its resources. I belong to its family. I benefit from it. What's my job? I go work the field. I take care of the livestock. I prepare the meals. And at the end of the day, of course, I get rest and sleep and I get to eat and I get all the enjoyments and benefits. But I don't own it. I didn't come up with it. It's not mine. It doesn't come from me. And Jesus turns the corner and says, look, you are to think of yourself the same way. Lord, what's my usefulness? Okay, you called me into the family. You made me a slave of Christ. You purchased me off the slave market of sin I didn't come up with redemption. I don't bring the resources that bring redemption about. I mean, this this is such a problem in the thinking of our culture, our American culture. I grew up assuming that every country in the world was like our country. Every country had the resources we had. I just toyed with it, played around with it, entitled to it. I just, I was free. In fact, I didn't know where the money was coming from. I saw my dad leave in the morning. Came home at night, didn't seem to be too big a deal. And whatever he did to, you know, get through that pile of paperwork where, you know, now I know what that paperwork is. It's survival with bills and those things. I never knew that as a kid. I was just entitled, absolutely entitled. Didn't think anything of it. By the time I became a teenager, I already knew more than him anyway, so I didn't need his advice. (laughs) I remember taking about $300 of my paycheck and putting it in $1 bills one time, getting the kids around the table and saying, all right, look at all this money we have. Isn't this awesome? What are we going to do with this? They're just like, wow, look at all that. I said, but a shower is going to cost this much. How many showers we take during the day? That much. And, you know, we got gasoline for the car and we got food and groceries and, you know, flush the toilet. You get, you know. (laughs) Pretty soon those piles are just going down. We we don't have much left. A couple to shake together, maybe. What was I trying to do? Trying to crush the sense of entitlement. This doesn't come from nowhere. And God put you into our family. You didn't ask to be born in this family with these things, whatever that may be. And in, in this illustration, that is Jesus' point. Look. You're not trying to turn this upside down and imagine that if God gives you a task to do, two things are true. He's got to somehow continue to guarantee you uh, that your assessment is upheld. Look, if it looks frightening, Lord, you got to give me more. If it looks like it's going to need this, you got to give me more. No, I've already given you what you need. You have my spirit. You have a measure that you need of my promises for this particular task. Believe the promises and impossible things are going to happen. And by the way, when I use you like that, just remember, just remember, you're not entitled. You haven't somehow become somebody so that you get the glory and it's all about you. No, if you're apostles or you're a rank and file behind the scenes person with a gift that no one ever sees or anything in between, just remember this. You're a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not owned by you. You're owned by the the estate of redemption. His house, his family. He brought you in by his love and mercy. He owns you. You can do whatever he wants. You're unworthy. And when you've done all that he's commanded, and of course the implication of the illustration is each day, but certainly all that he's commanded, right? That's how I'm to disciple, to teach others to observe all that he's commanded. When you have gotten to the end of your usefulness today or your Christian life, nothing's changed about your status. You're still an unworthy 
privileged slave who's only done what is expected of that status. Man, we get so lost in ourselves, don't we? We are weak in faith and then God uses us and we use it as an opportunity to just step on other people and be territorial and we're all about this and I'm all about this and and you're not about that. Oh, you poor person over there. We get territorial, we get selfish, we get strife-mongering, we, we get unuseful, weak in our faith, and all of it, beloved, becomes a hindrance to the truth. All these five reinforcements were everything the Pharisees didn't do. Everything the Pharisees didn't do, this was what they were all about. They were naive about the influences both inside of them and outside of them. They were flippant about what God says about the truth. They were negligent in confronting one another and forgiving one another. They were weak in their faith and ultimately proud in their service. What was the result? Utter blindness to their Savior. Do you live with that sense that if God uses me at all, oh, Lord, you're the one that strengthened my faith muscle and you've already given me enough resources. In fact, I haven't really utilized even a fraction of the resources you continually give. You're so generous, right? Anyone who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach. What does that mean? Without holding against you the way that you squandered the last time he gave you wisdom? Man, when you keep that mindset, Lord, I don't even use a fraction of what you do give. I don't believe a fraction of the promises you have made. My faith is sometimes pure and puny, and and oftentimes it's a little larger, yet it's mixed and not as effective. And, oh, God, when you do use me, I somehow think I'm better than people. Or or I, I take my... Hands off, I get, I get lazy, I, I, I let my guard down, I get proud, and I become a hindrance to the truth in that way. When we've done all that he's commanded us, man, those words just penetrate, don't they? When we've done all that, Lord, when I've done all that you've commanded, even just in a single hour, no, 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 don't look to me, Lord. I, I'd much rather be like Peter. When he saw Jesus calm the storm, he hit the deck of the little boat and said, get away from me, oh God. I am a sinful man. I can't even keep vigilance in prayer for you for one hour. And the Lord said that. Could you not even pray with me for one hour in the agony of my soul before I go to the cross? You know what? There's no record that they said anything. I, I would hope that there would have been a grabbing of his feet. I'm sorry. You're right. I can't do it. And the Lord just picks us up like he did the woman in John 8 and says, I don't condemn you. And he says to the apostles here, I want to use you. Just do this. Consider yourself an unworthy slave who's only done what's expected. You get to the end of the day, Lord, I didn't even do a fraction of what you wanted, I'm sure. And, and yet there were some victories today. I served you. It, it, was, it was mixed faith at times. It was real faith at other times. I'm your unworthy slave. Do with me as you choose. You want to put me in a trial that I will not fathom uh, for years? That is your prerogative. Lord, you want to put me in a season of generous usefulness that, that I can see, though you owe me nothing? That's your prerogative. You want to make me pray for a relative for 40 years and I don't see any movement? That is your prerogative because you are my savior. You're the sweetest master I could ever be the slave of. And you have never done me wrong or in some way in my redemption cheapened it. I'm the one that continues to 
to have to be worked with by you. Isn't that sweet? What a great warning to us. Great reinforcements for us. Lord, may the Lord help us to live like that. Bow with me. Hmm. Heavenly Father, this has been just a gripping bit of instruction. We see the the way that you so quickly tell us that impossible things will be possible if our, if our faith is real trust in your promises. We say increase our faith and the way that you grow it is often sometimes weaning us from ourselves because we want to see things our way. And then you graciously work with us, kind to always use us. And then when we are used, we use it as some sort of opportunity for self-glory, thinking that, that the privileges you give us are somehow entitlements or rights or they ought to make us shine. Thank you for giving us this illustration. We're the slave plowing the field. We're, we're tending your sheep. And when we've come in from the field, serving you till the day is long is to be our highest privilege in belonging to you our greatest and sweetest duty because you're our master and until all that you've commanded has been done we should never be tempted with some sense of our own worthiness but even after all that you've commanded is done we're still slaves still unworthy only doing what a, what a redeemed sinner ought to be doing for our Redeemer. What a joy and privilege to do anything for you, to wake up and have a thought of you, a sweet and precious moment with you in prayer, a, a tenderized heart in a trial where we call out to you. We're privileged to walk in your word, to have your word, to have our minds open to it. We're privileged to, have, to know disciples and friends and other Christians. Lord, we're privileged to be bought with a price. Help us to live in these reinforcements. We pray it in your masterful name. Amen.